Good morning, everyone. Uh, I would like to welcome you to today's seminar webinar on how induced earthquakes are making us rethink the challenges of earthquake engineering uh, by Dr. Abby Lyle, an associate professor at the University of Colorado Boulder. Uh, a few logistics before we start. Um, you all can see a control panel uh, where uh, you can um, you have two different boxes. So you're going to be muted uh, throughout the, the webinar, but if you have any questions, either uh, in terms of support for the webinar or technical questions uh, for Abby later on, please feel free to type them uh, in the question box. Uh, also, today's presentation is being recorded and will be available within one week at the ERI's YouTube channel. Uh, I would like to give you a big background on uh, the Youngers Member Committee, who is the particular entity who organizes uh, this uh, webinar. Uh, the YMC provides opportunities to early career professionals within the EERI organization to advance their careers as earthquake professionals and become more active in the Institute. Uh, I am Maria Koliu and uh, I'm co-chairing this committee with Anahid Behruzi and Guillermo diaz Fanas. Uh, in this slide, you can uh, see a summary of the YMC activities, um, and we are doing different uh, events uh, throughout the year. Uh, if you're interested in joining, uh, please visit us at our webpage, uh, ymc.eeri.org, or we would be happy to answer any questions you may have at email ymc.eeri.org. Uh, we also have a subcommittee as part of YMC, uh, the Virtual Earthquake Response Team uh, and co-chairs are Erika and Mani, and this particular uh, subcommittee is very active in post-earthquake reconnaissance. Uh, if uh, you're interested in joining, um, there is a, a dedicated page on uh, the YMC webpage that uh, you can take a look at. Without further ado, uh, I would like uh, to introduce uh, today's speaker, uh, Dr. Abby Lyle, uh, who is an associate professor at the Civil, Environmental and Architectural Engineering Department at the University of Colorado Boulder. Uh, Abby earned uh, her undergraduate degrees in civil engineering and public policy at Princeton University. Uh, and then uh, her graduate studies uh, with the Masters of Science in Civil Engineering and uh, Building uh, and Urban Design from uh, the UK, and she also holds a PhD from Stanford University. At uh, the University of Colorado, Abby has worked on uh, various problems related to seismic performance of concrete buildings, uh, snow loads on structures, and flood damage in the 2013 uh, Boulder, Colorado floods and induced seismicity. And she has been also the recipient of the Shah uh, Family Innovation Prize Award uh, from ERI and recently received uh, the Charles Hutchinson Memorial Teaching Award from the University of Colorado's College of Engineering. Uh, so without further ado, I will pass it to Abby to uh, start her presentation. Thank you everyone for joining us. I'm, I'm really delighted to give this presentation. Uh, and I wanted to thank Maria and the Younger Members Committees for inviting me um, to do this. Um, Maria and I spent some time talking about what topics might be of interest um, for this presentation. And we thought, well, a lot of earthquake engineers are interested in induced earthquakes, um, but a lot of the focus in that area has really been on um, the geoscience and geo geophysics side. So what I really wanna do today is talk about um, how the problem is relevant to earthquake engineering and what we can potentially do about it. Um, and the work I'm going to present, so I, I pulled a few things from other people, but most of the work I'm going to present is from um, my students and postdocs that have worked um, worked with us. So um, my presentation is organized around th three challenges, I think, that induced seismicity brings for earthquake engineering, and then I'm going to go through and talk about and talk about each of these. So the first one, um, that thing that I'm hoping to convince you of, and probably a lot of you are already convinced of, is that humans do cause earthquakes, and this changes our role as earthquake engineers. Um, the second one is, is that moderate magnitude um, earthquakes, as we've seen with from induced seismicity, um, do have real impacts on building infrastructure and communities, and I have some documentation of that and some um, details about um, what's mattering for people in these kinds of events. Um, and then finally, I'm going to make the case that induced seismicity does increase our risks, um, including risk to life safety, and that poses some questions about how we should respond in terms of management and mitigation. Okay, so I'm going to start with the first one, which is that humans do cause earthquakes. So um, we've known for a long time that human activities can cause earthquakes. So 
this uh, data here is actually from Rocky Mountain Arsenal, which is where the US Army was disposing of chemical waste um, in the 60s. Um, and you can see here that in this paper published in Science in 1968, they really clearly documented a correlation between um, injection of that waste and earthquake frequency. Um, so this uh, waste in Rocky Mountain Arsenal did cause several damaging earthquakes um, in Colorado, magnitude 5, magnitude 5.3 or something like that, and window panes, damage to ceilings and light fixtures, some damage to unreinforced masonry. Um, and because it was the Army doing the disposal, there was a lot of carefully documented data about volumes of water and, and um, earthquake and earthquake frequency. Um, so, and this led to um, a number of other activities in the 60s. Um, in early 70s to try to understand this phenomenon. In fact, there were actually even some controlled experiments in Colorado trying to understand how um, various activities might cause earthquakes. For most of this presentation, I'm gonna focus on earthquakes that are caused by uh, wastewater. So most of this wastewater is created during um, oil and gas production and development activities. So it's massive amounts of water that are part of the um, domestic energy development. Um, and that that water has to go somewhere. It has a lot of chemicals in it. And so one of the things that happens after the water, once we've recovered the water, is that it is injected very deep underground. So the plot, the figure on the left shows um, basic kind of a cartoon of the fracturing process, hydraulic fracturing, where there's a massive amount of fracturing fluid that goes into those jobs. And that fluid is then recovered and used to be disposed of somewhere. Now, I do want to emphasize that um, hydraulic fracturing is not the only activity that creates wastewater. And in fact, a lot of different, um, different activities in the oil and gas sector create a lot of wastewater. And we're seeing a big increase in wastewater in the past 10 years or so because of the relatively, um, relatively large increase in domestic energy production through um, a lot of these means. Uh, now, the photo on the right is a photo of an injection site. So this is a place where wastewater is being um, injected deep into the ground. There's quite a bit of this in northeastern Colorado. So this photo is from Platteville. Um, and probably a lot of you have seen um, facilities like this and maybe not even known what they are, but a lot of them are putting water deep, deep underground. So how does this disposal create earthquakes? Um, what basically happens is that when you um, inject, when we inject this water deep underground, it increases the pore pressure um, pore pressures in the earth. Uh, the process of earthquake generation is that, you know, we have, all of you know, we have faults and they have some normal stress on them, some friction that needs to be overcome. And as the stress condition around that, that fault is changing, for example, um, through a, by injecting water, that can create, potentially cause an earthquake to occur. Um, a couple of interesting things to note here are is that there's a lot of faults in the basement that we don't know about or that are kind of not well um, documented. And so a lot of places that we might be injecting fluids, there could be faults or other things down there that we maybe don't have a great understanding of. of. Um, the, uh, the other important thing is that a lot of parts of the crust are fairly close to being critically stressed, meaning that we're not looking at like huge perturbations in the normal stress or the shear stress on a fault needed to cause earthquakes to occur. It, relatively small changes can potentially cause earthquakes. So as a result, um, the earthquake um, activity around Oklahoma in the past decade can, face it, can mainly be attributed to this wastewater disposal. So this plot, probably a lot of you have seen, is showing the uh, significant increase in earthquakes that occurred uh, around 2009 in Oklahoma. And in fact, in 2015, there were more magnitude three events in Oklahoma than in California, bigger than magnitude three, I should say, um, around 800 events. So before I get into the engineering, I do want to say that um, other activities can also cause earthquakes. So I'm going to focus on wastewater injection because that's really the main thing that's or the primary thing that we think is going on in the central US at the moment. But um, this plot is from um, the Netherlands showing on the left earthquakes um, and on the right reservoir compaction. So in this case, what's going on is that um, gas is being extracted. That is um, changing the pressure in the reservoir itself, which is um, increasing the stresses on faults. 
So it's kind of the opposite situation there. So there we're taking something out and that activity is creating earthquakes. And then a lot of people um, are curious about how hydraulic fracturing relates to earthquakes. So um, I, in the US, we mostly think it's the fluids from fracturing and other activities that are creating earthquakes, but there is some documentation in other places that the fracturing itself can create earthquakes. So this is some data um, from Canada, which came out this year in science showing um, as a function of time, basically the volumes of water used in the, in the hydraulic fracturing process and the occurrence of earthquakes and making a case for a um, strong temporal correlation and that that can be attributed to the earthquakes coming from the fracturing itself. Um, there are other things that I'm not gonna talk about that cause earthquakes, um, geothermal energy, um, carbon sequestration, potentially reservoir filling and emptying just of, you know, water reservoirs. And all of those are basically affecting the stress distribution in the earth. Before I move, um, this is my last slide before I get really into the earthquake engineering piece, but I also wanted to make the case that geoscientists can increasingly link earthquakes to human activity. So this um, plot is from, is of pressures, poor pressures in the Raton Basin in Southern Colorado. So on the Colorado, New Mexico border, there was a significant earthquake for Colorado magnitude 5.3 in 2011 there. Um, and so there have been some studies uh, to try to investigate what might have caused that. This paper and others by this group at um, my colleagues at the University of Colorado um, is basically arguing that those earth that earthquake and some of the other ones that have occurred um, was caused by um, waste, wastewater injection. So here, um, this plot is showing actually their modeling of pore pressures. So what they're trying to do is show how if you make a model of the earth, you can predict how pore pressure diffusion might happen and you can observe increases in pressure that can potentially be linked to the occurrence of particular earthquakes. So in this case, the earthquakes they're showing are these little uh, white circles um, and the pressure increases are the colors. Uh, just as a point of reference, um, in other places, pressure increases of, of about 0 0.05 to 0.15, kind of depending on the situation have been shown to cause earthquakes. So anything kind of in the green and above, you could, there are other examples where we know that that level of pressure change uh, might potentially cause earthquakes. Um, and so this is an example of the modeling tools uh, that geoscientists are, are building up to um, augment our correlations of time and space to show what kinds of act human activities are causing earthquakes and in some cases what particular well might have caused a particular earthquake. Okay, so the next thing I want to do is explore what this means for us as earthquake engineers. So um, the next point I wanted to make was about what, what is really the impact of these low to moderate magnitude events um, on, on buildings, infrastructure, and communities. Uh, one comment I get a lot when I tell them I'm working on this is, well, um, that damage isn't that severe, or um, these earthquakes aren't that big, so why are we really worried about these earthquakes? So I'm gonna try to make the case to you that we should be worried about them um, and show what kind of damage we have observed. So to make that case, I'm gonna start with the example of Oklahoma. Um, which has seen a lot of seismic activity. So since 2009, earthquakes in Oklahoma have um, led to $4.5 million in insurance payments. But there's an important little footnote there, which is that that is a, almost certainly a vast underestimation of the true economic consequences of the earthquake damage because relatively small percentage of Oklahomans have any in earthquake insurance and those that do, it generally doesn't cover um, a lot of the types of damage that we've seen. So true economic costs substantially more than 4.5 million. In terms of what does this damage look like, this is the particular case of the magnitude five event that occurred in 2016 in Cushing, Oklahoma. This is a, um, a map of the town and the red shows photos that were taken by the EERI reconnaissance team looking at damage from that earthquake. Um, and if we look at some of those photos in particular, th this is an example of a masonry building that had some parapet damage, um, and some damage to the chimney um, right, right at the roof line and they might, might potentially be at risk of falling. In the Cushing earthquake, um, we also saw uh, quite a bit of damage to uh, up here in the top right, um, interiors and non what we would con consider to be non-structural components. So cracking of gypsum wall boards, cracking between the connection of the wall and the ceiling, um, a fair amount of facade damage, and then again, maybe some potentially 
really significant damage to um, unreinforced masonry construction. And a lot of this has been in older buildings, um, but, but also some non-structural damage in, in newer buildings. So uh, one of my students um, at the University of Colorado has collected a lot of this data. So he has photos and media reports and um, insurance evaluations from homeowners and data from the Did You Feel It uh, webpage that USGS has. And he's kind of combined that all together. And we've made some lists of what we think is happening more frequently. Um, obviously, this is somewhat unquantitative in the sense that this is all, all of the stuff that we could gather. It's by no means comprehensive. Um, but what we've seen there is that um, a number of different types of facilities are, are affected. So, but most commonly homes and small businesses. We did see um, some damage in municipal buildings in various places. Um, in terms of infrastructure, it's mostly cracking of asphalt roadways um, and utilities. There's been some um, damage to water, to water distribution. In terms of structural system, unreinforced masonry and wood frame construction come up um, by far the most often. And then but there has been some cracking and other things observed in other types of structures. We did the same thing with a list of kind of more specific damage um, characteristics. I, I'm not going to read these, but just you'll notice that there's a lot of cracking inside and outside of walls, um, a lot of things that are associated with mortar um, in mortar in masonry or either as brick veneer or um, unreinforced masonry construction, also some windows and falling tiles and things like that. Okay, so, so what this shows is that the, the damage is primarily what we would consider to be non-structural, but that it still can have significant economic impacts for the people who um, own these facilities. So um, this slide shows some results from a survey that some of my colleagues at the University of Colorado have done. So they reached out to, or they, they had survey responses from over 200 households in Oklahoma. Um, and on the left, what it's showing is that um, over 40% of the people that they surveyed had experienced some earthquake damage. Um, and 18%, so that's approximately 40 households of the 200 they surveyed um, had more than a thousand dollars of earthquake damage, which as far as, you know, kind of engineering costs is not very expensive, but if you personalize that and think about your home and the expense to your budget, household budget, um, it starts to seem like a much more significant potentially impact. Um, the right plot is really showing that these costs are being almost entirely borne by the owner of the facility. So um, the plot on the right shows that um, 99 percent of the people that said they had some damage did not get any compensation for that damage um, most the largest green rectangle did not seek any compensation and then the others up here so about uh, five percent were denied um, when they made an insurance application and then another six or seven percent are currently seeking some compensation either from their insurance company or they're involved in um, a class action lawsuit of which there are a couple going on at the moment. And just one more plot from uh, their survey, which, uh, which will become important later, is that residents also perceive that damage is accumulating over multiple earthquakes. So there's some evidence from um, the geophysics of the problem that fluids being injected and migrating along fault can potentially cause swarms of earthquakes, um, multiple related events, and is certainly the perception from the survey that that those swarms of events are causing um, increasing damage. So what, what I next want to move to is a couple of analytical studies that we have done to try to investigate the damage potential from induced earthquakes. So the first one I'm gonna talk about is attempts to answer the question, do earthquakes have different effects on structural response than tectonic earthquakes? Um, and then I'm gonna look at what is the potential for seismic loss and damage in light frame wood buildings, um, considering also sequences or swarms of events. So in each case, I'm going to talk just very briefly about the methods of the study um, and then about what, what we've learned and what might be some of the outstanding questions. So starting, starting with this question. So to attempt to investigate whether induced earthquakes have a different effect on structures or buildings um, from <clears throat> tectonic earthquakes, we started with a model of a um, unreinforced masonry chimney a residential chimney, so the type of chimney that a lot of us have on our houses. Um, we, why did we start with a chimney? Well, there has been quite a bit of chimney damage, and we know that a lot of the other damage that we've seen 
in these events has related to um, unreinforced masonry. So as far as capturing something that had some of the vulnerabilities of the types of damage or types of structures, and here I'm using structure loosely to include a chimney, types of structures that we've seen and try to understand how that damage is sensitive to the characteristics of the motion itself. So this chimney is basically a brittle structure that we're trying to use to understand how induced motions might impact structures um, differently than tectonic motions. And if you're thinking in the performance based earthquake engineering framework, or basically trying to understand that intensity measure to EDP, engineering demand parameter relationship, and see are, are there sensitivities there um, that we might not anticipate um, because we haven't don't have a lot of evidence or exploration of induced earthquakes. I don't wanna spend a lot of time on our, our modeling, but we, we did start with a finite element model and then we use that to calibrate a <clears throat> open seas model, which basically has an, a, a non-linear spring that captures the flexure critical response of, of the, the chimney we're trying to model. Um, although I'm not gonna show it, we also did a sensitivity study and we can um, be happy to share those results with anyone who's interested. Uh, sensitivity study looking at the the modeling parameters specifically. So to answer the question about the effect of induced versus tectonic earthquakes, um, we started by collecting some ground motion. So this is a, a plot showing the ground motion, the earthquakes from which we have ground motion records. So we have um, magnitudes between about four and 5.5 and then distances um, from the earthquake from about zero to 40 kilometers. We specifically selected the tectonic set to be as similar as possible to the induced set. So we have comparable magnitudes and distances. Um, and then we also um, focused on those records that had large enough ground accelerations to be of interest in engineering analysis. So our selection criteria is similar magnitudes and distances in the two sets and kind of the biggest motions we could get um, within, that, within that context. So just a little bit more about the record sets. Um, on the right, we have a box plot of the spectral acceleration from the two record sets, and you can see um, they're pretty similar. This spectral acceleration is at about 0.3 seconds, which is the period um, of the chimney that we're, that we're interested in. Um, however, if you look on the left, there are pretty significant differences in the peak ground acceleration. So remember, we started with a group of records that are similar in terms of magnitude and distance. Um, when we did that, we got pretty similar spectral accelerations, but somewhat different um, peak ground accelerations, and that's really indicating that there are some important spectral shape differences in the record set, which I'm going to show on the next slide. So these are um, response spectra from the from the ground motion sets that we're using in our chimney analysis. So the red are the induced are motions from the induced set, the blue are motions from the tectonic set. These are unscaled, so we haven't done any scaling of these records yet. Um, and you can see that around the period of the chimney. The response, the, the spectral acceleration is pretty similar, but that the induced set has more energy here at short periods, and then there's a pretty significant, um, there's a more significant drop off with that set than with the tectonic set. This is the, we tried to quantify that the differences in spectral shape between the induced and tectonic set. We ended up using to represent spectral shape this ratio of the spectral acceleration at 0.3 seconds to the ratio at 0.5 seconds. So that's telling us basically how steep the spectra is in the region in which the chimney or other kind of brittle stiff structures might respond. And what you see is that on average, the induced set is a little bit steeper and that there's more outliers in the induced set. So there are some that are quite steep um, in the range of the, <clears throat> in, in the period range in which our structure is responding. So next I wanna show what are the implications of this for structural response. So in order to look at response of the chimney, we did, we did go ahead and scale these records in an incremental dynamic analysis. And the goal of that was to get a collapse fragility curve. So that's shown here. Um, so these plots are showing ground motion intensity represented by spectral acceleration on the x-axis and probability of collapse on the y-axis. So what you'll see here is that the probability of collapse for the tectonic motions in our set um, for a given intensity level is a bit higher than the probability of collapse for <clears throat> the induced um, motion set. And that difference in collapse fragility can be attributed to these differences in spectral shape that we have observed. So this plot on the left is the same one we saw before. These are the unscaled spectra, and it shows the initial undamaged period of the chimney and how much we think the period is elongating before collapse occurs. So that's how we got the 
range of about 0.3 to 0.5 seconds. Um, and you see that the induced records are less, have less energy or are falling below the tectonic records in that, in that region. And in fact, we can show um, that the spectral shape issue is highly correlated with the collapse value. So this is a plot of all the data together. And on the x-axis is our spectral shape measure with steeper, uh, more peaked spectra to the right. And our y-axis is our collapse probability or our median collapse spectral acceleration for each of the records. And we see that there's a strong correlation between a steeper spectra and higher, higher collapse probabilities, because as the period is elongating, it's moving into the part of the spectra that is less damaging. Now, a lot of you will probably tell me, well, we've known for a long time that spectral shape is really important. So this um, analysis is basically saying that, yes, indeed, spectral shape is important and that it is really important for understanding how um, induced motions might affect structures differently than tectonic motions. Um, and just to kind of show one more slide to convince you, I'm replacing the plot on the left with spectra of the ground motions and they're scaled to collapse. And you see that in order to get collapse of the tectonic motions, you have to bring up that curve to be about on top of the red one. And that's why the um, tectonic ones are appearing a little bit more um, damaging than, than, the induced, than the induced motions. Now, these differences in spectral shape, um, this is something we're still working on, but they seem, they seem to be associated with both differences in the characteristics of induced events, so stress, the stress drop of those earthquakes, as well as um, some differences in um, attenuation in the central and eastern uh, U.S. versus in California. I also want to make one other point on this chimney study before I move on to talking about wood frame buildings, which is that we do see that the magnitude of the earthquake matters. So one of the things that we've been looking at a bit and we're, we're continuing to study is that lower magnitude events um, have not been much studied by earthquake engineers. We know they can still cause damage. This plot is showing that for a given spectral acceleration, um, lower magnitude events are less damaging. So you see that the magnitude four events Ground motions from magnitude four events um, can be scaled to higher ground motion intensities on the y-axis before you get collapse um, as compared to ground motions from larger events. And that's because um, the magnitude of the earthquake is related to the um, breadth of the frequency content. So lower magnitude events tend to have a more, uh, more peaked, narrow frequency content range, and that um, is less damaging for structures. But we anticipate that that characteristic is the same between tectonic and, and induced events. So the difference between the motions from tectonic and induced events seems to be um, the, the, the stress drop and attenuation issues, which lead to basically small differences in the structural response. So the next thing I want to look at is the potential for seismic loss and damage in um, light frame wood buildings from sequences of induced earthquakes. In this case, um, in this study, we are uh, examining modern one and two story multifamily residential buildings designed for seismic design category B, which is the design category which is um, applicable in most of Oklahoma. Um, I've shown here the elevation and plan views of the one story building. So it's basically six um, apart apartment units or, or condos um, next to each other. The two-story building that we looked at is actually is actually a set of townhouses. So we have um, designed and analyzed both of those under individual um, induced events and also sequences of induced events to understand um, the damage and losses in those buildings. As far as the modeling strategy, we are using Timber 3D. So we are indebted to um, Professor Pang at Clemson University for sharing both his uh, modeling uh, software, Timber 3D, and, and some of the models. Um, and that modeling software basically allows you to um, relate fastener and connection response, his theoretic response to shear wall response, which can then be used to predict um, the seismic response at, at the building level. And one of the important things about what we're doing in, in using Timber 3D is that our models do account for not only the structural walls, shear walls, but also the effect of finishes on those walls. So there's been a, a, a number of studies recently that have shown that um, finishes on wood frame construction are really important for understanding seismic resistance. And so our modeling attempts to capture those effects. Um, we're using, for the shear walls, we're using a hysteretic model that's a, this is a mouthful, but a modified version of the modified Stewart model. Um, and our focus is on capturing basically initial strength and stiffness and then the degradation of strength and stiffness of that, of that um, system. For this study, we are using um, 
a somewhat different ground motion set. So we have um, ground motions obtained from Oklahoma and Kansas, and we, we selected them so that we could get some sequences of events, which I'll talk about in a second. So the magnitude distribution of the events that we use to get the ground motions is shown on the left, and on the right we have um, the peak ground acceleration. So again, you see that you know we are able to get some recordings, 0.1 g, um, and even somewhat bigger, but a lot of them are right, right, right here around around the median. Um, we then applied these records to the structure, um, a 3D model, um, using incremental dynamic analysis. I have a footnote here that we have used hazard consistent IDA. So and that's what that means is that we know that scaling ground motions has problems and cre can create some biases. And the hazard consistent IDA approach is a way um, to reduce some of that bias when, when you scale the records. In terms of quantifying damage, we're using um, loss assessment. So we're interested in the dollars, so how much does it cost to repair um, damage to a building, but we're also interested in uh, seismic loss assessment, like a FEMA P58 type of analysis, because it allows us to really understand what might be going on in the structural and non-structural components that is not exactly apparent from the structural analysis model itself. So for example, these three pictures are showing types of damage that you can identify probabilistically in a uh, loss assessment, um, which then allows us to kind of say not only were the drifts some level, but also that this is the type of damage that we would anticipate observing if this ground motion were to affect this building. Um, for the purpose of the loss assessment, we are using the SPP software, which to capture so we take our structural response and put it as input into the SP3 analysis, and that gives us uh, both overall losses and also distribution of uh, repair costs among different components. So this plot is showing on the x-axis the spectral acceleration of the one-story building that we were looking at. So it's almost the same as the chimney, incidentally, 0.3 seconds, and the loss as a function of the repair cost or normalized by the repair cost or the total replacement cost of the building. So you can see not surprisingly, as the uh, ground acceleration increases, we get more loss. Uh, more interesting, I think, is the distribution of losses um, among different components. So for the purpose of looking at these wood frame construction induced earthquakes, it's not actually that useful to separate non-structural and structural components because almost everything that's going on is happening in, in the shear walls and some of it's happening in finishes and some of it's happening in the walls themselves. So we have, showing here that at a level where you might have seen, where we might have seen shaking in Oklahoma um, or Kansas, you know, we're seeing most, the model would predict some damage and that damage would be in the shear walls and to a lesser extent um, in, in, the, in the piping. So if we kind of dig into the details of the loss assessment, this would basically say that um, at this level of around 0.3 G of spectral acceleration, some piping supports have failed, there might be some minor leaking, um, and in terms of the walls, shear walls are um, maybe, I mean, sorry, screws may be popping out of exterior walls, um, and there might be cracking over paint and fasteners. And so in a, in a broad sense, this is roughly consistent with what we have seen in Oklahoma, which is that in some of the bigger events, we've seen spectral accelerations in this, in this range of about 0.15 to 0.4 G, and the damage that we have seen in wood frame construction is, is qualitatively similar to what we're observing in the model. Also keep in mind that some of the older construction might be somewhat more vulnerable than what we're modeling here. So we also investigated this perception that um, damage is accumulating over multiple events. So what we did here is we selected um, ground motions from different events which occurred um, close, to, close together in time and space. Um, and subjected the, mo the structural analysis models to the first motion and then the second motion. And to understand how potentially vulnerability may be increasing, we, we scaled the second motion in a uh, incremental dynamic analysis process again. So the first um, result from the sequences, and again, this is for the one-story building, is that damage in the second motion tends to be more of the same. So that's more cracks, longer cracks, but nothing that is qualitatively different. Um, so what does that mean in terms of if you're a building owner? That means that the repair costs of repairing it after the first event are probably not that different from the repair costs of repairing it after the second event. You have, you got a little bit more cracking, but the action that you would need to take to repair that damage is more, is, is 
likely similar unless the second event was a much larger intensity. You can also see that in this plot. So we have the ground motion um, observed in the first motion on one of the x axis, on the x axis, the ground motion from the second motion on the y axis, and this again is lost. This looks like I lost my um, label. This is normalized uh, dollar losses. And you can, this plot is symmetric, so it's basically saying the spectral acceleration from the first motion and spectral acceleration from the second motion are having comparable effects on um, the, the response. This analysis also shows that vulnerability is not increased after the first event. So this is pretty consistent with some of the literature on aftershocks and damage from aftershocks in more highly seismic areas, which is that you need to have a pretty substantially damaged building before it is more vulnerable in a subsequent event. So the fact that we're getting some cracking doesn't appear to be um, making the building less likely to able to withstand um, damage in a subsequent event. Now, if they're really, really severe damage, this would be different, but of the levels we've seen, um, it's not really increasing our vulnerability. However, um, the multiple events are increasing the overall cost of the damage. So imagine you're a homeowner, let's say, and you have some cracking in your, uh, in your drywall. If you were to repair that, and then there was another earthquake, the damage would be very similar, but you would be essentially be doubling your repair costs because you had to do it twice. So what this is saying is that from an engineering perspective, we're not seeing vulnerability increase from these events, and we're not really seeing a big change in the nature of the damage after, between the first and se second event or third or fourth. However, the perception that people are feeling the damage is increasing is probably, it's, is justified in the sense that they are probably watching cracks get bigger in their homes if they haven't repaired it, or if they have repaired it, they are they are saying, well, I just paid X number of dollars to repair my building, and now I have to pay that again um, to, to compensate for the damage. So finally, I wanted to look at um, how induced seismicity potentially increases seismic risks and some management and mitigation strategies. So this is the, the risk integral which many of you have, I'm sure have seen. So, and the reason I want to show the equation itself is that quantifying risks involves understanding something about hazard. So how likely different events of different shaking intensities are to occur and something about what the consequences of that um, shaking level will be. So here's our risk integral. We're trying to compute the mean annual frequency of exceeding some performance target of interest. Um, we're, I'm gonna focus mostly on collapse. So the annual frequency of um, having collapse occur. And then that is the convolution of the seismic hazard and the fragility. So here, this piece is the seismic hazard curve. And then this one is the related to the, the is the derivative of the building fragility curve. So in attempting to quantify risk from induced earthquakes, we have to both be able to pull something about hazard that makes sense in an induced earthquake context and something about fragility so that makes sense in, a, in an induced earthquake context. So for hazard, we are using seismic hazard from the USGS one-year forecast. So I'm sure many of you have seen these. These are models that the USGS put out in 2016, 2017, and 2018. They are based on data from the preceding years. So they basically are assuming um, that the level of seismicity, let's say, that was experienced in 2014 and 15 would then be continued in 2016. So this is uh, pointing out one of the big challenges of induced seismicity, which is that the amount of seismicity we get is dependent on actions and operations of a number of companies um, and facilities. And so it's actually pretty hard um, to understand how, how what's going on now might relate to what's happening next year. But we're using these, ha these uh, seismic hazard from the USGS one-year forecast, and they are based on data from basically the um, immediate near term. So this plot is showing the seismic hazard for Oklahoma City. So we have ground motion intensity on the x-axis, mean annual frequency of exceedance on the y-axis. The blue curve is um, the hazard from the 2014 National Seismic Hazard Model. So that does not include induced seismicity. Um, in fact, events that were thought to have been induced were mostly removed from that model. 
The 2016 and 2017 models are here. So most of the results I'm going to show today are for the 2016 model. So this is showing a significant increase in hazard relative to the 2014 baseline. Um, and that increase is kind of happening over a range of ground motion intensity. So it's not just at the lower levels like you might expect. Um, th these models are predicting an increase over a range of ground motion in uh, intensities. I have the, the gray models here. Um, which are some alternative models that were explored in 2015. There's a bunch of uncertainties about how to deal with induced seismicity and seismic hazard models. What is the maximum magnitude that a induced earthquake can have? What is, is the rate of occurrence of those earthquakes and um, how, how should we handle them differently than um, other types of seismicity? And those differences are captured in these gray models. So the reason I have the gray hazard models here is just to show that the 2016 um, and 2017 models are kind of um, toward the middle or lower end of, of a range if you look over the range of models that were evaluated. So one of the questions we get a lot is can we verify the seismic hazard forecast for induced seismicity? How do we know that the ha seismic hazard is reasonable? So we did a comparison of did you feel it responses to seismic hazard? So the did you feel it is, I'm sure many of you know, the USGS web portal where you can go in if you felt an earthquake and provide some responses to questions that then allow the system to estimate the um, intensity of the earthquake or the intensity of ground shaking at the site that, that you were at. Um, so the did you feel it basically allows us to have this um, crowdsourced, if you will, data of ground shaking intensity, which can be compared to the model. So this plot is showing um, different levels of ground shaking represented by the uh, modified Mercalli index. And the red are from the 2016 USGS seismic hazard forecast. And the, the black are basically seismic hazard um, observations from did you feel it responses in Oklahoma and Kansas. And I think this plot is actually for Oklahoma City, although I didn't, I didn't label it here. One important thing to note is that the black curve and the red curves do basically overlap right here in the middle. So that's indicating that if you follow the same set of assumptions, more about that in a second, that you, did, you do get a pretty similar hazard from the did you feel it as you get from the hazard model, which is based on ground motion prediction equations and things like that. Now, the other thing of importance to note here is that this region of overlap though is pretty small, right? So what, what we're seeing is that people are observing and responding to a lot of events, a lot of frequent events, right? and that we don't have any observations out here at more significant events. So the extent to which the hazard model um, is reasonable out there is just is hard to know based on uh, two years of did you, did you feel it responses. Um, the other thing I wanna call your attention to is that we did have to make some important decisions and ensure that the did you feel it results and the hazard model were um, evaluated similarly. So in creating the hazard model, um, the procedure is often to declustered the, the catalog to basically separate out so you're only keeping independent events. And we had to do the same thing with the did you feel it data to make this comparison. Um, but it's, it's indicating that um, in, in the range at which we can um, evaluate things, things are looking pretty reasonable. And this is the same kind of plot, but this is now for the whole region. So the left is the did you feel it based mod hazard model for an, um, MMI of five. On the right is the PGA, which of those are pretty comparable from the USGS one-year forecast. So that's going to be the hazard piece that we're going to put into our risk integral. Um, you also need fragility curves. So in this case, we're taking fragility curves from the 2015 MEHERT provision. So um, the blue one is the probability of collapse um, for risk category two or normal occupancy buildings. That's the one that defines the 10% probability of collapse under the MCER ground motion or the 1% probability of collapse in 50 years. So this is these fragility curves are built into performance targets in the knee hurt provisions, um, in the knee hurt provision. So the other ones um, I'll talk about briefly, but this one is that structural, non-structural components aren't following and this is collapse of risk category four or important building. The plot on the right is showing the fragility curve in derivative form. And I'm showing you this just to emphasize what part of, or what range of ground motion intensities matters for each curve. So the blue one 
is really most affected by ground motions between one and two or one and three times the MCE. And obviously the yellow one, which it happens at lower ground motion intensities is affected by lower ground motions. And then the orange one is um, the, affected by larger ground motions. So on the next slide, I'm gonna show the risk that we calculated for a collapse for ordinary use building. So that's based on this blue risk category two curve. Um, and what we did is we normalized the collapse by, or the collapse risk by the risk that is implicitly um, accepted by the knee hurt provision. So that's the 1% probability of collapse in 50 years. Okay, so this is, there's two plot, two maps here because one is at 0.2 seconds and one is a spectral acceleration at one second. And the places that are kind of blue or green, the risk increase is small. And then the places that are orange and red are, are much more significant increase. So what this plot is showing is that the collapse risk as computed from the combination of the seismic hazard and fragility curves that we have used is increasing. Um, and this can be somewhat surprising because a lot of people think, well, these are relatively small events that we've seen so far. And so why is it affecting the collapse risk? And it really comes down to the fact that our hazard models, and it's not just the USGS one, but other seem to suggest that there's an increase over a range of, of ground motion intensities. So it's not just increasing at these lower ground motion intensities, but the whole hazard curve is shifting. So as a result, even if you only have a small probability of collapse out here, the if we think that there is an increased risk of having a, a larger ground motion intensity, we are picking that up in our risk calculation. So we're seeing potentially a significant increase um, in, in risk. And again, this is based on 2016. So, um, you know, the difficulty here is a, that a lot of this is um, dependent on a, a factors that we're not used to considering. So specifically uh, regulation of injection and also how much water is being injected, which is related to the, str the strength of the um, de demand for some of the <clears throat> oil and gas resource. Okay, so this plot is showing um, the collapse risk again. Now I've got Oklahoma and Dallas, 0.2 seconds and one second. Actually, I wanted to emphasize one other thing here, which is that you see that the increase for at, of risk at one second for longer period structures is a bit lower than the increase for 0.2 seconds. Um, and, but that the area that's affected, if you look at the area in yellow, that's a bit broader. That's because of differences in ground motion attenuation between 0.2 seconds and one second. Um, so that trend is observed for both Oklahoma City and Dallas. That's one of the points of this plot. The other points of this plot is that this is the plot, this is the performance target that I showed the previous plots for. You see pretty similar effects for falling risk and collapse risk of um, more important buildings. So despite our kind of expectation going into this that we would see a big increase, let's say in falling risk or non-structural damage and a lesser increase in risk and other risks, we in fact see that, um, you know, if we think that it is true that these induced earthquakes could create magnitude six or, or above earthquakes, then we do see a pretty a, a significant increase in risk in some areas. Another question we could ask is, can we change our design values to mitigate this risk? So the answer is yes, we could. And here we've shown two possible options. So one is, let's say we want to achieve that 1% in 50 year target of collapse risk, right? That's what it says in the um, knee hurt provisions, that's what it says we're targeting. So if we did that, we would need to amplify our ground motion, design ground motion values at 0.2 seconds by these values here. So it could be a fairly significant increase. Um, the, the plot on the right is saying, well, maybe we don't need to achieve 1% probability of collapse in 50 years, maybe 10% in 50 years is good enough. And the logic there is that in areas close to faults in California, we're already allowing risks higher than 1%. So maybe we should consider a more liberal rule. Um, and so 10% in 50 years, and there you see there's still an increase, but the number of places that would be increased um, and, the, and the size of the increase. Is less. That is one possible strategy for ma managing and mitigating this risk. In fact, changing our building code or design values is probably not a very uh, good strategy in this case. Um, while it would improve the um, design <clears throat> or strengthen, let's say, new buildings, most buildings are not new, right? We have a lot of existing construction. 
And we know that the process of creating these earthquakes is incredibly um, time varying. So it really doesn't necessarily make sense for us to um, design something for the next 75 years that's only going to be ongoing for um, some shorter period of time. So that, that's an option, but it, it, it seems like it's not very well aligned um, with the processes that are ongoing. So the other three things on this slide are other things we can do. So there has been um, some regulation of wastewater disposal. Different states are doing it differently. Um, that can work well and dip, um, to reduce volumes, for example, of wastewater injected. However, it, it's kind of a blunt instrument because what you're trying to do really is reduce seismicity. And we know that's correlated with volume, but the exact kind of nature of the correlation is um, dependent on different places. And so it can be kind of a crude tool for um, reducing uh, damage or risk. There's also, um, I think, an important consideration here of insurance policies and compensation funds. So I showed some data suggesting that um, the people that are bearing the cost of this damage um, are not necessarily, uh, don't necessarily have uh, protection or, or other, they're bearing the cost of it themselves. And so you could think about, well, maybe there was some way to create a fund to cover some damage or to, to make sure that um, more people have insurance and that that insurance policy is covering the types of damage that we're seeing. Um, finally, and this is really a plug for more science and engineering in this area, is that all of these things would be more effective if we had better hazard and risk assessment tools to better understand the conditions under which damaging seismicity can occur. So you really have a lot of questions. We know there's a lot of places where there's a lot of wastewater injected where we don't see earthquakes. And so the question is, could we really develop better models of understanding if I inject here, what are the implications of that? And use that to design our regulatory um, actions and um, better prevent uh, future damaging event. I'm not going to go through this slide again, but these are the three things I was really um, ho hoping to convey to all of you um, that I think the damage, while not kind of catastrophic, has been uh, significant and that it's something that should be of interest to us as earthquake engineers. I really appreciate all your time and be happy to take a few questions. Thank you very much, uh, Abby, for the great presentation. Um, for the interest of time, I will, I'm going to read a couple of questions uh, in the order they came in. Uh, so the first question is for the full height exterior chimneys. Were they assumed freestanding for the full height? If no, what did you use as the analytical boundary conditions perpendicular to the exterior building walls? And if yes, how do the boundary conditions of the presence of the building affect your results? Yeah, thanks for that question. We, we assumed that they were freestanding. And the reason we did that was basically because in the direction that we were looking at, which is along the plane of the wall, we didn't think the connections in a lot of cases were that significant to significantly affect the response of the chimney. But um, in other cases, the boundary conditions might, I think it might, it might affect the collapse probabilities and things like that. I don't think it affects the overall trends as far as the differences between induced and tectonic motions. And that's one of the things we were trying to show in our sensitivity study is that um, regardless of the nuances of the chimney model, that the trends in the um, that we're observing between the induced and tectonic ground motions are relatively uh, constant. Thank you. So another question is uh, spectral shape uh, differences seem to be very dependent on the records used to get the plots. Is it possible that some induced earthquake values would be similar or exceed the tectonic earthquake values in the range of 0.3 to 0.5? Yes, and and certainly we ha you know we have there's a lot of variation in ground motion characteristics as I'm sure the, everyone knows and so. Um, that what we're talking about here is is averages. So on average, um, it appeared that the um, induced motions were steeper, but there were some that were less steep um, than the tectonic motions and would, are therefore less damaging. And then uh, uh, another question is, how did you deal with the uncertainties in the ground motion signal when dealing with the non-structural damage results? Right, so our, our loss assessment considers um, the effect of or the, the uncertainty in uh, floor accelerations and roof accelerations and story drifts um, at a given ground motion intensity level. And it also considers basically correlations in the structural or correlations in the non-structural component response. And so um, all of that is feeding into an uncertainty in the loss prediction, which I didn't show, but in any, you know, the, the median loss curve is the function of a bunch of realizations in which Cases, some of them didn't see much damage, and in other cases, in the same, in a different realization at the same uh, ground motion intensity level, 
you know, might have seen much, much more damage. So I present, presented only the average there, but uh, at least some portion of those uncertainties are carried through the loss assessment. And probably a last question uh, before we close up and we will follow up offline with the rest of the questions. Uh, did you consider the vertical motions effect for induced from induced events, any vertical motion information available for comparison? Um, we did not consider it. There are some vertical ground motions available, um, but we, we have not looked at those in detail. So that would be an interesting um, question. And we know in general that the vertical component of ground shaking has a lot of um, short period energy. And so particularly for structures that were pretty stiff um, in the vertical direction, there might there might be some effects, but I don't know what the differences are between the induced and tectonic. Event. Great, thank you very much, uh, Abby. First of all, to thank Abby for the great presentation and for taking the time to give that webinar for uh, the YMC and all the younger uh, professionals and all members of, of BRI. Uh, this uh, webinar is supported uh, uh, with funding under a cooperative agreement with FEMA and the US Department of Homeland Security. Uh, if you're all interested about the ERI YMC uh, committee activities, uh, please feel free to email us or uh, browse through our webpage at ymc.eri.org. Uh, PDHs are available and more information will be provided in a follow-up email. Uh, we would like to thank you again for uh, participating in this webinar and you will shortly receive a post-webinar survey. It will be very helpful for us if you fill it up uh, so that we can get feedback on uh, future webinars. And that being said, uh, I would like to announce uh, the next uh, YMC webinar uh, by Dr. David Wald uh, from the USGS. Uh, that will be on January 30th, 2019, between 9 and 10 a.m. Pacific. Uh, and once again, uh, I would like to thank you all uh, for participating in this webinar. And I would like to thank uh, Abby for taking the time to give us that excellent presentation. Thank you.